So a buck rig is actually an adaptation of what we call a motion base rig. And a motion base is a platform which moves with a data feed driven by a piece of software. The motion base is normally hydraulic or motorized. A buck rig is just an adaptation of that really. So a buck rig is designed to take a rider. It might be a horse or it could be a vehicle like a, a motorbike, but in this context, it's for riding a dragon. The buck rig is made so that it favors the roll movement. You know, dragons bank a lot like birds. So knowing that, knowing how they built the buck rig and that it's a form of a motion base, we knew that it's something that we could build into the system that we had to take previous. There's sort of an art to it in terms of we don't want to be just too destructive with the animation. We're very mindful of that. The whole reason why we got the animators in early was so that that animation would transpose through the pipeline from production all the way to post. In terms of the dragon photography, one of our mantras is that fantasy only really works if you ground it in mm. reality. If you come up with a camera language, a shooting language, and I was looking to things like Top Gun Maverick, we had methodology-wise two types of cameras we wanted to establish, which was dragon-mounted camera for the coverage on people, imagining that we were actually strapping a camera mount to the dragon in order to capture the performance of the rider, or dragon to dragon. So it's like the camera operator would be on a dragon somewhere near the, yeah. the dragon. We have X number of shots that we need to achieve because it's a very expensive setup to have the buck there and the motion control. And we have to get like five setups a day. If you don't go in there with a plan and execute that plan and visualize that plan for them so they understand, then the whole thing just starts to unravel. They start to reimagine the shot because it doesn't look like how they yeah. imagined and they lose confidence. Let's just go in and get some coverage of her or try something else. And then the plan is just gone. So having this where it's just like, we've got these many shots to do today, roll cameras, and then you see on your monitors that it looks like the previous that we've done or the storyboards or whatever, you know, that just reinforces the plan. The DP accepts it, the director accepts it, there's a confidence and right, we've got it, move on, next one. Motion control is using data to control a camera on a robot head, which allows you to do things like perspective only moves. So for example, if there's a big CG shot and you don't have the space to do it, you film the actor in perspective only. You shoot the element for reprojection on the CG camera later on in post. Motion control gives you the benefits of being able to rerun shots, program moves in already, the VFX. The buck rig in this instance, the main reason for it is obviously to give the performance for the actor so you can throw them around. There's a lot we can do to prepare. I remember the conversations with Tom Horton early on. If you give us the prep time and you give us all the significant testing time and you let us amalgamate with previs enough, we can do this. There's a big difference between animating in a previs scene or a 3D foot scene and then having it work in the real world on a huge mechanical rig. Certainly on season one, they had a buck, but not motion control cameras. The cameras were kind of crane operated. The biggest problem we had, they'd frame pretty close on someone. It's like, you know, what's this person thinking? And then you're stuck with a frame of a dragon rider with some wind, but not a lot, and just the sky behind them. We did try and kind of keep everything pulled out, but on the ones where directors did insist on going very close up, we actually ended up pulling a lot of those out, widening the cameras, doing CG, Mm. To the leg, like CG replacements on bodies in order to get some of that camera movement, get some of that dynamic feel, to see a little piece of dragon or a piece of wing or something. Every extra one of those elements takes you one step out of being stuck in a studio with rear projection. I think rear projection was the way Ryan kind of described how he felt about those shots. And I completely agree. They're very hard to make look yeah. <laughs> authentic. We came up with various solutions, tried various Things, did a lot of R&D several months before we actually went on set and tried various approaches so that the live footage from the camera can be put onto the previs that we can validate and also see how is the shot going to look in the end because when you're there and, and you just have the robot, the buck and lots of blue and the LED panels used for lighting and not really content this time around, you don't really know what, how it's going to look. Sure, the camera motion and everything looks cool in the end, but does it work in the context of what we're trying to achieve with our previs? In one of the shots, one of the actors who's riding on a saddle is bombarded by a blast of fire by another dragon. And on the spot, the director asked, can we add fire to this? On there, we, we downloaded some fire assets that we had in our library, put it on the wall, and we had a cue for the actor that when the fire appears, they react accordingly. 
and suddenly we've had a level of interactivity where the wall is now driving the actor's performance. So we used the LEDs for various things. We used it for lighting, blue screen that was following the first trim of the camera. That was animated as the butt rotated. We also used loops for cueing the actors if they had to do a specific performance on the buck and also eye line. So for example, if Melee's is turning round to look at Renice, mm. we would have a dot that she could follow so she knew where to look. The beauty of that is again, because it's all a real time system, it's tied in with Unreal and it's all synced with the buck. So it meant that we could animate all of these as the buck's moving to the timing of the move. So it was all synced up. We could throw fire elements on there to get the fire blast off Aegon's armor. And a really a lot of it was driven by PJ. He'd never worked with us before, the DP. He was new to working with us and our bespoke system. And during the testing phase, we had a few days of tests before he first came in and he got used to it and very quickly became familiar with knowing what to change. We'd also put the wing flaps on there for shadows. And those dragons were actually running in Unreal straight from the previous. And each dragon has its own cadence. So it's very important that that matched the buck rig. So yeah, there's lots of lots of reasons why the LEDs were useful, which you don't often think about because a lot of people think backgrounds content. When we moved to being on set, we didn't realize we'd need until we got there a really robust tracking sheet where we're tracking exactly what the light setup is called for each take that we're using. We're tracking exactly what animation file we've used for each take. That was the kind of info that would be beneficial when it came to sharing all the data with them at the end of the project. The final shot when Vagar lands, when we watched it in the cinema screen, big sound system, bigger screen than what we've got here, that was really like, wow. It was amazing, you know, it's like Godzilla-like approach. And I just thought, this TV, that's crazy. 